So welcome everyone. Today we are presenting the work done in sprints 82 and 83. Um, as always, we've got the team slides here. Um, we do have uh, today, I'm excited we're going to have our first um, course reserves demo. And so Kelly has put in some slides. Um, how do I get this out of here? <clears throat> um, Kelly has put her um, team up in the slide deck. Um, and we've got some slides here for her team and developers. Um, we also have some new to the project um, team members I wanted to introduce. <clears throat> so let me quickly scroll through. We've got Yasmin from UNAM. So welcome, Yasmin. And then, uh, let's see, are they in here somewhere? Ah, two new folks on FoleyJet, Vladimir and Igor. And then a couple new folks on Spitfire, Dennis and Alexi, uh, Alexander, Vitali, and Dimitri on Vega. Whole bunch of new people on Concord. Um, Andrei, gosh, I'm probably going to butcher these. Ilya, two Ilyas, and a Yulia. And I think that was it. And that, that seems like a lot. I should mention that some of these new team members are um, permanent on their teams, and others are temporary. And they're helping out with these teams um, while they ramp up, and they'll be transitioned to other teams um, like Firebird which will be working on the quick mark or single mark record editor um, in the coming weeks. So um, when those guys get rolling, we'll create a, a slide for that team as well. So welcome um, to everyone. And it's really exciting to have you on the project and great to see that you're contributing already during your ramp up period. All right, so with that, um, I will hand it over to Jakob to talk about release milestones. Thank you, Kate. Hey, everybody. Uh, a quick update on the ongoing release. Uh, same flower. The first uh, deadline was on the 3rd of March. Uh, you still presenting, Kate? I am. Or Do you still I? see my screen? Uh, not right now, no. No, no, it works. Thank you. Um, so the 3rd of March platform components deadline, uh, there's been some initial releases uh, for platform components, including Stripes version 3.0, IMB 29, um, and, uh, and the copy 2.37. Uh, so the next deadline is Friday, so this week. Uh, that's the module release deadline. Uh, by Friday, we expect that all modules have uh, Q1 compatible releases. Um, so assuming all that goes well and all modules are available, uh, the following week will be an integration week, um, uh, during which uh, the DevOps uh, team will try to uh, construct a release candidate um, uh, from the provided module releases and construct a uh, test environment for, uh, for Fameflower. Uh, and assuming it all goes well, uh, Backfest will be bootstrapped with the new release, the new release candidate, and, uh, and, and, and backfesting will start on the 23rd of March. So that's the, that's the plan for the next couple of weeks. Um, and then the release uh, uh, backfix deadline, so essentially <coughs> deadline by which all bugs discovered uh, throughout the backfest uh, must be um, Corrected and modules uh, should be re released with bug fix releases is on the 6th of April, and the release uh, will become public on the 10th of April. Uh, all right, thank you. If there are any questions still about this, please you know, thank me uh, or ask them on the releases channel. We'll be tracking the channel for any release related activities. Um, I, Kate, I think we'll skip the otherwise hot fix releases. We covered that a couple of times. Um, uh, we have started discussing, uh, the CAP planning team has started discussing the, um, uh, the, the preliminary timeline for the Q2 release. This is not set in stone yet, but it's, it's the likely scenario. Uh, so the plan for that release is uh, similar to what has been 
um, uh, what has been executed in the previous quarters. Uh, there is one major difference. Uh, uh, we're planning a platform uh, components release deadline much earlier this time around, uh, almost in one month before the module release deadline. Um, what, uh, what this, uh, this uh, <coughs> deadline will involve is a AP frozen set of uh, API shows instead of uh, platform components. So after the 15th of May, uh, APIs will no longer change uh, for the platform components. Uh, only bug fixes or um, or if necessary functionality will be will be provided. So only additions, no changes. Um, uh, so that's going to be the first uh, first that first first milestone in the in the in the release in the Q2 release timeline. The second is June 12th. That will be the next module release deadline. So by that time, all modules in Folio uh, uh, should see um, Q2 compatible releases. And then um, uh, taking it from uh, from the uh, from the release deadline, uh, uh, the plan is similar to Q1. So essentially, an integration week, the following week, uh, then a bug fest. Although this time around, bug fest will is planned for two weeks. Um, uh, so one week longer than uh, than bug fix in Q1, and then 10th of July is the bug fix release deadline, and 17th of July will be the um, uh, the release deadline. So release will become public uh, by 17th of July. Uh, so again, that's preliminary, but but very likely at this point. If you guys have again any questions about this, um, thank me or um, ask them on the release channel. I'll be also publishing this shortly on the on the Tweaky um, and the releases um, um, area. Uh, Kate, would you mind switching to the next one? Oh yeah, uh, I think that's me. I'll just mention two things. There's no uh, as a as a platform PO. There's no um, demos this time around from the platform team. So there are two new uh, noteworthy uh, features uh, uh, provided within the list of sprints. That's the optional dependencies uh, via the optional keyword uh, functionality in Otapi, which allows modules to define optional dependencies, so dependencies which may or may not be present in the running system. So the idea for this functionality is to allow uh, um, uh, allow to deploy slimmer versions of Folio, uh, and this has been requested by various groups, including Stripe's Stripe's Force and acquisitions. So. Uh, so it's a small addition, but uh, but can help creating a smaller and nimble audio installations. And the other noteworthy functionality is the streaming streaming GATS utility in Rama Module Builder. It's a mul it's a it's a general purpose utility. Uh, it's been used to develop. Um, it's been in the first round. It's been used to develop the um, or help help building some of the batch. Uh, expert interfaces. Uh, the, the plan is to roll the functionality across most Folio APIs to make sure that by default, uh, get functionality in Folio can benefit from streaming um, and address some of the performance issues we've been having with those interfaces. So uh, that said, and if you guys have any more questions about those functionalities, uh, Follow the links here, or uh, uh, please post questions on the Ram Module Builder channel. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jakob. <clears throat> so I'm just going to breeze through these slides. Um, all the teams have the highlights from the past sprints. And that will bring us to the demo slide, which is not here. <clears throat> Let's see, it's out of place. Ah, here we go. Um, yes, all right, so um, for demos, it looks like we're going to kick off with Thunderjet with Alexia and Mikita. <clears throat> Hello. Um. Let me share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Uh, so basically in acquisitions, uh, uh, 
we are glad to introduce uh, to you functionality of receiving uh, receiving flow. Uh, uh, recently, it was uh, leveraged from UI orders application to a separate UI receiving application or module, and um, uh, we uh, after uh, feedback was gathered, uh, we uh, changed a view, uh, like a form of um, receiving a flow from model based to separate screens. So I wanted to show you that um, here we can uh, observe in UI orders, uh, order I prepared. It's in uh, open status uh, and uh, it has uh, two push server lines. Uh, one is uh, connected to the inventory, uh, some demo item and um, uh it it will have uh pieces created uh on the open order stage so basically we have uh several locations uh waiting uh, pieces and uh, uh we have uh definitely uh connection to the inventory so uh Another uh, push server line um, has uh, ability to manually add pieces. So I'll show you that as well, manually receive item. Uh, so you can go to the actions folder and uh, click receive. We uh, can observe filtered titles for several uh, push third lines. And uh, here we have our six uh, pieces created. Uh, so the main uh, thing, uh, we, we can uh, edit piece. Uh, since it's automatically created, uh, some things as caption are missing, but that's fine. Uh, and uh, we can actually receive that item from here. And uh, we have uh, that receive button instead of uh, individual receive. So here we have received screens with a list of uh, pieces. We can select them all. Uh, enter some additional information like barcode, uh, location, call number, uh, commentary. We have a request column, uh, if any request created for a particular item. Mm, and click receive. So since we have a request for that item, uh, we, we will get reminder. So here we have uh, empty expected uh, list and uh, all pieces goes to received. Uh, the same uh, for unreceive, if we received something uh, like uh, by mistake, we can uh, undone this. So, mm, uh, regarding, uh, uh, another item. Let me uh, mail. All right. Here we have uh, title for manner receive uh, push through the line. So uh, we should able uh, to manually add pieces. And um, here we have add item functionality since uh, we should connect that to inventory. So here as well should enter some required information. 
basically that's add item functionality and uh, we can receive as well uh, and uh, uh, the same for unreceive uh, basically uh, from receiving part that's it uh, thanks I think we can proceed with Nikita Thank you. Hello. Nikita, are you ready? Yeah, let me share my screen. Um, let me find my... Uh, send this one. Do you see it? Yep. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so I'd like to uh, describe uh, how adjustments can be initially added to invoice. So uh, we have adjustment settings uh, where I created before demo two uh, adjustment presets and uh, adjustment one and adjustment three have uh, always show flag uh, enabled uh, and adjustments two um, is without the flag. Uh, so one and three uh, will be added initially to invoice uh, when we click new so yeah let's do this and uh, we see uh, two adjustments uh, initially uh, predefined on this form uh, and can be saved or actually removed and edited uh, no matter and uh, that's it with uh, this feature I, additionally, I'd like uh, to add a few words about our uh, kind of global change for invoices and uh, finance models. Uh, we moved away from uh, search and sort component and uh, uh, layers, layers approach uh, when uh, search and sort and list uh, view uh, is always under the form or another view. And uh, we have uh, view per root and uh, with it we have better performance and uh, uh, now we have more control under under the list uh, like uh, the most visible example is finance uh, a list where we adjusted um, filter Spain previously uh, we have overflow for navigation and uh, um, horizontal uh, scroll box and uh, now it's adjusted and uh, looks much better uh, and uh, that's it from my pile thank you thanks Nikita looks good um, okay so FolyJet is next up for demos with Anne-Marie kicking it off Thanks, Kate. So um, Taras is going to show some updates we've made on the matching profiles. Um, we've in the UI, you've been able to match to various folio record types, but now we are adding matches to mark record types and also what we're calling static value matches. And then um, Maria is going to show um, putting together job profiles and associating match and action profiles and, and unlinking them. So that's, that's the quick intro. So Taras. Okay, uh, I will start my demonstration. So, do you see my screen? No, not yet. And now? Nope. Nope, unless it's midnight. Ah. Oh, here it comes. There we go. Okay. So, um, uh, 
you can see, as you can see in the uh, list, uh, we have different types of uh, matches we can do uh, using our match, uh, match profiles. And now uh, I will show you how to do them, those matches and how to change them. Uh, and what we can do with uh, our new um, super component, uh, which is a flexible form renderer, uh, which allows us to um, render dynamic and form and the static views uh, using the JSON configs, which can be stored on server and uh, they will be in um, by the end of the sprint. So uh, let us begin. So as you can see, um, we have the um, uh, record type selection tree where we can uh, choose the existing record uh, to match against and um, uh, incoming record. Uh, so we can create uh, mark holdings with mark holdings. And uh, you can see the uh, set of fields that we can use to uh, do this action. So um, uh, we can actually um, choose another type of um, incoming record or like uh, choose static value and it will change. Uh, now we have um, ready to use section for text value only, but uh, later we will be done a number, date and date range from date and to date. So let us begin with uh, Mark Holdings. So change it back. Um, we will enter some field, subfield, uh, use a qualifier. Um, uh, please bear in mind that uh, all of those uh, sections, uh, optional sections and so on are completely dynamic. So, Uh, they can be used that's your subfield so just the one one character there oh uh, yeah of her. yeah so for this uh, let's go further and Yeah, make this one alphanumerics and we can save it. Oh yeah. So Mark Holdings, save. Okay, uh, so yeah, we can choose it and view the static view of the form. Um, so we can see all of those fields where uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, filled in. So we can edit this form. And we can change it like to this one begins with and uh, ends with and save. Yeah, so you can see these changes. Also, we can create um, another one um, like static values. Uh, another profile to match uh, static values again against uh, those same uh, mark holdings. And we can set some text here to match against and repeat uh, all of the operations to get this uh, for the existing record. Yeah, 
So static values, and you can see that uh, static values also work. So you can edit this and even change the to mark bibliographic uh, back and uh, so you can see that uh, you can change uh, incoming and existing records uh, just on the fly and save it so i won't uh, save this uh, but believe me it works um so how can it happen uh, can you see my screen now yes so uh you can uh, now you see the um, uh, config sample for this uh, match profile form. Uh, as you can see, uh, each section and field and so on has control type uh, for which uh, it selects uh, a control we need for current section or control or a field or so uh, from the. Uh, Stripes controls or local controls. Uh, stripes first, local second. Uh, we have a static control type uh, using which we uh, draw and render static views. We use dynamically built IDs augmented with name uh, section namespaces and uh, repeatable fields indexes um, because uh, this all is a huge repeatable field. So this all. So we can um, actually um, like, um, we, we can actually create uh, almost any type of the form using this. However, uh, uh, now we're not creating forms themselves, but we create a form renderer that uh, renders the form UI components. It was done not for matching, uh, but for mapping profiles because we need to cosplay or mimic the forms from the other apps, uh, not duplicating the code. So uh, uh, that um, way uh, was invented to do this task. Uh, it allows us to draw the similar controls uh, with the similar look and feel, but different data and different field names. So. Yeah, and uh, we'll we'll be showing the field mapping profiles next next sprint review. Yes. <clears throat> so um, uh, uh, I will do a different demo for Stripes uh, Force later. Um, if anyone is interested in this uh, uh, form renderer, please ask questions. I will answer them as, as soon as I can. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thanks, Taras. Thanks, Taras. Uh, Maria's up next. Yes, hello. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I'd like to demo updates we made for job profile settings and I've already created a new job profile. So let's edit it. And now user is able to associate a match or an action profile to the job profile by clicking on this plus sign. For example, let's add some match profile. And then let's set some action profile. And please note that uh, we cannot add a match profile after the be added action profile, only one more action profile, for example. So um, this associated profile tree actually describes how a uh, job profile will be processed. And uh, as you can see, match profile has two subsections, like for matches and for non-matches. -match, non 
And uh, these sections uh, actually represents um, uh, such structure like um, if else, for example, when uh, the job profile is being processed and a uh, match was found, uh, then executes um, for matches sections, for example, um, update action. And if not, then execute for non-matches section and uh, ignore for matches section. For example, we can create some entity. So let's save our job profile. And here we can see how the tree uh, looks like um, on the view details pane. And now I'd like to check, for example, match profile. And here uh, you can see that our test match profile is associated to our newly created job profile. And the same for the action profile. Here it is, our job profile. And also like to add that we can uh, correct our tree. For example, let's um, unlink this action profile, confirm unlinking. We see that the action profile remove, was removed from the tree. Now let's save. And yes, view the screen also updated. So that's it from me. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Maria. This is really, it's starting to become really clear how all these pieces fit together. It's very cool. Finally, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we still have a, a lot to do in Q2. Um, we, we are getting to the point where we can create the inventory record types, but we're still working on updates. We're still working on um, getting all the matches in place. We're still working on getting Mark holdings in. We've got to hook up to Mark Cat. We've got to hook up to Quick Mark. We've got to improve performance. So just a little bit to get done in Q2. <laughs> Sounds like it. Anyway, nice work the past couple of sprints. It looks good. Um, okay, so um, next up we have Vega with Dimitri. And then Alex. Hello. Hi. I already start sharing the screen, please say me will you will see it. We see it. Okay. Uh, I will show you several stories in scope of current story we add possible for display column number prefix, column number, column number suffix volume and enumerable in chronology. You can see current data in the uh, open loans. Uh, the same information you can see in loan detail on loan details page. Next case, when we want to change the date, we see current information. After we change the date, we also see current information. Uh, next case, when we want to run a view. And the same for second one. Okay, now we want checking the first item. You can see current information, the second item. Now we can see the same information on the close loan. First one. First one and second one. That's all. Do you have any question? 
Looks great. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, you're up next. Yeah. Tell me when you see my screen. We see it. Okay, so I'd like to show you a couple of new features uh, Tim Vega has been working on over the past couple of weeks. This one, the first one <coughs> is the extended support for PixSleep template tokens. Now, PixSleeps, um, they've been around for quite some time now about the support for template tokens. Template tokens are these things. They, it, it's been very limited, only a few of them like eight or 10 were enabled before. Uh, we have extended the support to uh, implement uh, support for all of these tokens, except for very few that don't make sense um, to pick slips like these two, which are only relevant for items in transit. And this one, which is only relevant for hold requests. Um, now, just to remind you where PixSlip is, it's just a small document that contains information about uh, page requests, uh, the requested item, and the request itself, and the requester, the user who made the request. Okay, to demonstrate to you what we have done, I've prepared a user, a test user that uh, has a delivery address uh, which will make a difference. You will see that in a minute. And I have prepared three page requests. Now the first two are requests for items um, assigned to a lo uh, location which belongs to CERC desk one. And the third request uh, is for an item which is assigned to CERC desk two. Uh, this makes a difference because uh, the PixSleep report is built for all items in status paged, which are um, will, which have the effective location, which matches the currently selected uh, circulation desk. Currently, we have circulation desk one selected, so the PixSleep report should include only the first two requests. Let's see how that goes. Let's create a big slip report. This one is for service desk one. Yeah, and as you can see, the big slip for one request takes two pages now um, because it has a lot of tokens going on. So as you can see, all of the tokens are filled and for the first request, the service point pickup um, is not filled because this one, because the fulfillment preference is delivery. That is why uh, service point pickup is empty, but the delivery address lines are all filled. Conversely, for the second request, which has fulfillment preference hold shelf right here. You can see that service point pickup is filled while the address is empty. Now, if we switch the service desk to cert desk two, we should see only the third request um, in the report. There it is, as you can see, only one request in the report. And that's pretty much it about the pick slips. And another feature I wanted to show you uh, are the patron notices uh, triggered by FIFA and actions. As you can see, I've created a test fee fine owner 
and manual charge that I will use for this demo. So I will use the same user. And as you can see, I've already created three identical charges for this user. And as you can see, my inbox is empty at the moment. Let me do it like that. Okay. So uh, we have implemented uh, the sending of a patron notice upon wave transfer and error actions. Let's try the first one. Let's wave. Let's select the reason. Hit a wave. Now we should see a wave notification coming. While we're waiting, I can do the same thing for transfer. There you can see that's a notification for wave. Let's do transfer. And for the last fine, let's cancel it. Okay, so we have successfully processed all of the fines and we have a notification for WAVE, another one for transfer, and there's a third one for cancellation. And that's all I got for today. You guys have any questions? Very cool. Thanks. I was thinking the same thing. That's really cool to see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, cool. So the next is Concord with Igor, and then Ilya, and then Victor. Uh, let me uh, say a couple of words uh, before we start demoing. Go ahead. <laughs> this is Magda, uh, I'm PO for uh, data export functionality. Uh, we spent last month on exporting inventory instances with underlying MARC records. Uh, we will demonstrate uploading the file with input uh, identifiers of the records that we want to uh, export. This functionality will be demonstrated by Igor. Then we will uh, show the triggering of export job and storing generated files in the module local storage. This is a backend work and it will be demonstrated by Ilya. And uh, the last uh, will be Victor that will uh, demonstrate the UI work for running jobs and completed log jobs. Since we still have some uh, work remaining for integrating backend and front end, you will see some static data, but we wanted to display it today uh, so you can see what are elements of the components that we are using on our landing page. As I mentioned, this will be uh, demonstrated by Victor. Um, Igor, are you ready? Uh, hello, hello everyone. Yes, I'm ready to share my screen. Okay, I'm sharing. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to present, I'm going to demonstrate uh, the uploading functionality of data export. The purpose of file uploading is just to provide a list of identifiers of the inventory records to be exported uh, later. So uh, there, is, there is a drag and drop panel on UI. Uh, we use it to upload uh, CSV files. And uh, now it is integrated with the backend the module is able to upload only CSV files. So if I choose a file with wrong extension, uh, for example, RTF, then UI uh, shows a uh, specific notification about wrong extension and prompts user to choose a CSV file. Mm. 
the file has been successfully uploaded to the module's file system. Now I'm going to show uh, my Docker container for the module. Uh, the uploaded file should be there. Let's let's quickly ver verify the file content. Just a second. And here is my file with inventory GUIDs. In order to do not uh, overflow the module by a large number of uploaded files, there is a specific uh, periodic job that cleans up deprecated files. It starts every hour and removes uh, deprecated binary file data. And uh, in addition, we have established rich documentation on the GitHub that describes the REST API uh, and steps to pass the file uploading process. So that's all about me. Thank you. Hey, Sigar. Looks great, uh, Ilya. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. <clears throat> Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so I'm going to demonstrate triggering the expert job and uh, storing generated files in the module local storage. The purpose of uh, this functionality to read UADs of records from already uploaded file, uh, receive records based on UADs from record source storage, and then write them to new generated file on local system. So in future, uh, we'll add also functionality to download this file by uh, download link from front-end side. Uh, I want to mention that I'm going to make this uh, demo on my uh, local environment uh, as far as we don't have uh, the integration of this expert process in UI and uh, as we don't have access to um, file system on remote environments. So uh, let's start. Uh, I already prepared some data. So I already have uploaded uh, file with UIDs. So let me show it to you. Uh, so uh, currently you can see uh, the file system of the Docker container of uh, module data export. And we have just one folder for one file. Let's go inside. So you can see that we have just one file. So let's uh, see inside the content of it. Uh, and you can see that we currently have two UADs for two records. Uh, so now let's send the request from Postman to generate a uh, file these records. Okay, seems it uh, finished successful. So let's check. Uh, we can we should see a new folder. Yeah, and you can see it's this one. So let's go inside. Okay, and you can see that we have new file. It has the same name as previous one, but with additional timestamp in the end. Uh, so let's read the content of it. Okay, and you can see that we have content of two records inside this file. Uh, I think that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have some questions, please ask. Thanks. So I'm sorry, I may have missed. So th those were the source records at the end that it had pulled, is that right? Mark, uh, Magda or Ilya? 
uh, sorry, you, you mean? Um, the mark, the, it was mark records at the end or was it instance records? There were instance records. Instance records. Oh, oh, oh okay, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I was confused. Thanks. All right, thanks, Ilya. Uh, and lastly, uh, Victor. Uh, hi guys, could you could you please verify it with guys whether you can see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. So uh, great. Uh, basically, uh, as a part of my uh, demo, I just going to demonstrate uh, what we can see already on uh, the landing page. So, and I just want to mention that for now we only see static data uh, for the list of running jobs and uh, jobs works. And we already have integration in place uh, with the backend. I mean, for retrieving the data upon interval uh, in five seconds. But for now, it's not uh, tied up with uh, UI. In order for me today to demonstrate you what uh, the, the end UI will look like. So, and uh, for running jobs uh, uh, here in the, this is accordion. We will have a list of uh, running jobs, and when it's collapsed, we will see the number of items in it and uh, as a part of running job uh, uh, component we will see information about job profile uh, output uh, file name uh, amount of records uh, who has triggered uh, the, the job uh, when it's began uh, and the in, the in process in progress indicator uh, which we actually plan for q2 and it won't be available for q1 and uh, the same applies for uh, buttons uh, in order to cancel pause or resume the job. And uh, for job box, I just want to mention that uh, on the landing page, only 25 uh, jobs uh, works will be displayed and we plan to have uh, additional page for uh, uh, possibility to view them all. And uh, for there, we will be able to see the information about file name, ID, human readable ID, job profile, amount of records, uh, when uh, the job has completed, and uh, who has run it, and status. And for Q1, we also plan to deal with only success status, and we'll uh, deal with both of them in the Q2. Uh, last but not least, to mention here that we also can uh, sort all fields uh, apart uh, file name. So, yeah, you can see it. So uh, basically that's it from me. Thank you. Nice, thanks Victor. Thanks guys, this is really progressing well. Okay, cool. So that was Concord. It looks like Stripes Force is next with Rasmus and then Ryan. Rasmus, Hello? are you talking? Ah, there you are. Can you hear me? Yes, and All we right. can see your screen. Can you see my screen? All right. Hi folks, uh, I just have a few minor things to share today. Uh, firstly, we have added a sub value prop for the key value component, which is this one. And uh, it renders uh, an italic text just below the value. And this can be useful for rendering contextual information for a key value. And I guess in some cases it could also help limit the amount of key values shown on a page. So uh, key values, if you're not familiar, are used to uh, display information uh, often in, in preview panes, as you can see here. And the next thing I'll show you is a new component we added called Highlighter, which I have right here. And um, the Highlighter is a comp component that is useful uh, for highlighting uh, information or text on a page. So for example here, and um, uh, text highlighting can be used for making certain information pop out on a view with a lot of information, which can make it easier for the user to, to scan and find the information. For example, uh, a barcode or an ID. Um, 
The documentation and the demos for this can be found at ux.folio.org slash storybook. And uh, that was all for me. Thanks. Nice. Thanks, Rasmus. All right. And I guess I'm next up. You this are, is indeed. Brian. All right. And just let me know when you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so the feature that I'm demoing here today is um, handling for uh, an expired um, session um, for a user. And um, so currently, uh, what happens in the world of Folio is that um, uh, after you've logged in um, and you've been logged in for a certain amount of time, um, the tokens um, that's used for authentication um, eventually expire and um, they don't renew currently. So um, because of that, uh, users will eventually start to experience errors um, when their token expires um, and they keep seeing those errors until they um, log in again. And so uh, what we've done here is we've made that process a little more graceful um, so that the user is aware that their tokens expired. Um, they're redirected to the login screen and then they're able to log in and then return to their work. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just uh, go ahead and navigate to uh, just a just a record and uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it and uh, to simulate this um, instead of just waiting for the token to time out I've kind of set up a unique uh, instance where I can just block the request and um, pretend that it's an expired token so I'm going to do that and uh, just make a, a simple edit and I'm blocking the request to edit this record and so what will happen is I will get redirected back to the login screen. And then there's a little message down below that says your session has expired. Please log in again to resume your session. And then um, just so I don't get kicked out again, I'm gonna uh, turn off that blocking and then I'll log in again. And it's going to bring me back to the page that I was editing. Um, the change that I tried to make that I didn't save um, uh, won't persist. Um, so I'll have to make that change again and then save the record uh, for it to go through. But I'm at least brought back to the screen that I was before um, so that I don't have to rerun all my searches and everything. So, um, Yep, the goal of that was just for that to be a, a nicer experience for the user rather than uh, before they would just start to see a bunch of alert windows uh, complaining that the API calls are all failing with a, a 401. Um, so that's that's it. Any questions about this? Thanks, Ryan. That looks okay. like a super clean user experience. I like it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next up is course reserves. Kelly Drake. Are you ready, Kelly? Oh, there she is. Yes, I am. So can you see my screen? Um, yep. I just want to start out and just since this is our, our debut, um, just to remind or let everybody know what course reserves is. Um, it's an app that um, I have a, there's a page on the documentation tips and tricks section that describes what the course reserve app is and pretty much how to use it at this point, but it does, it's um, creates the ability to create course records, cross listed courses and descriptive information about the course, as well as to associate and reserve physical and electronic resources with the course. Um, and change the related loan rules and locations of items on reserve temporarily for while the course is on reserve. Um, additionally, we've also done some functionality for integration with uh, currently ViewFind so that half of the purpose of course reserves is so patrons can see what's on reserve 
and now through viewfind they can. Um, so a little bit of history then before we, there's the app. Um, but a little bit of history, um, the development team for this has been um, Mike Taylor and Kurt Nordstrom from Index Data. Um, Ian Hardy has been working on the viewfind integration along with Damian Katz um, and lots of other people too. Um, this spec was develop, has been developed over two and a half years. Uh, it started in the RA SIG many years ago. And then in 2018, Anya Arnold took over as PO of a special SIG uh, that was de devoted to reserves. Um, and pretty much by the end of 2018, it was a fully developed spec, but as there were no development resources at that time, the team retired. In 2019, Index Data picked it back up um, and we reconvened the RA SIG. At that point, I became the PO. Um, a lot of members from the original RA SIG, RA Reserve SIGs were, were still with us and we just sort of updated the spec. There, they had done a really good job. There wasn't much to do, just sort of bring it in line with where Folio was at the time. So then development started in August-ish and we are coming out, coming out in Q1. And that's sort of the quick story of what it is. Um, so here's Here's what you see when you click on the little course reserve button. Um, you have a listing of the courses. You can create a you know, new course by hitting the new button. Um, and that's how you, and that'll bring up your course screen. You enter your course information here. You'll be able to select your department, uh, which is a field in the settings. So there's, um, it's a settings field so that you, each library institution can enter their own departments. Uh, course code section, course description, all that information is entered for each course. Um, some of this can be imported if you're migrating. Uh, you have the option of course type, which is another um, settings field. Registrar ID for eventual implement integration with uh, any registrar systems that you may have. Your term, term is also a settings and will also also functions to set the default term in the item when you add items to the record and the same with location. Um, we'll set the default location for an item if an item is added to a um, course. So then to see a, a full, um, a very, a course I definitely recommend to everybody is aardvark tweaking. Um, it's very important earth science class. And so this is what it looks like filled out. The idea of, if you're not familiar, we'll go to cross-listed courses. Oftentimes a, a school will have different course names and course codes for the same course. So that's why you need the ability to cross-list. So basically what that will do is it'll duplicate what we call the cross-listed information or the um, information that stays stable through multiple cross-listed courses. Um, so as you look at, uh, I think, do we have a cross-listed calculus 101? No, we don't. Uh, I should have looked at this first. Okay, so this course. Um, um, so if there was a cross-listed course, we could just pop it up here. We would add the course. You can see the, the stable information um, already pre-populates. We add the new information. I don't know, car buying. Who knows? It's in the math department, it's got a course 401, and you just put that in here, you save and close it. And now you can see the cross-listed course shows up with the original course. That's, a, that's why um, when staff have to maintain courses, it's really important to know what the connections are between these courses, and, and again, not to have to duplicate information. So that function is there, and that's awesome. Um, and then, of course, when you're looking at a course, you want to see um, what items are on reserve for it. So that's when you get into the items. So you create the course, and you can add items. And the way to add an item is, actually, this is a very uh, reading-intensive course. You just basically scan the barcode, um, and that will add the item. I don't know if this is a real item. Probably not. So you can just grab a barcode. So you have to know the barcode from inventory. 
but by scanning the barcode, it adds the item to the course, and then the uh, user, it pulls all the information out of inventory. The user can then edit the course, edit the reserve item. Probably not a good selection. Uh, can edit the reserve. It doesn't edit the item necessarily. It edits the reserve information, but it will set, I don't know, my computer is pretty slow today. It will set the um, temporary loan type of the item. So it will go back to the item record and in inventory and set that. Here we go. So in here you can, this is, so when you scan the barcode, it goes and gets the information out of the item information out of inventory, um, like the title, uh, author, inf and information like that. Then you are able to create the temporary information that goes with the items reserved. So as its temporary location, by default, when you add an item, it will use the temporary location of the course. But if you need to change that, you can. And this brings up all of the locations that are um, in your inventory instance settings. This is uh, Simmons. This is our Simmons library. This is actually pretty close to production information here. So these are all of our reserves. This is, um, they only have one loan type, so we, don't, we can't do that. But we know that some libraries will use um, temporary loan types. Um, we have a processing status field, which is specific. It's the course reserve processing status field. This is also maintained in the settings um, so that um, the staff can know if something's recalled. They can run reports on recalled items and see what's going on. I forgot to know what time it was when I started, so I'm going to probably run a little late or faster. You can change the start and end date of the reserve item. If it's an electronic item, you can start to track. Uh, the URL will also go into the course record, the course item record. And you can do um, some copyright statusing reports, things like that. Um, we also are having search and filter by course. So that would search your course information. Currently, you can search keyword search, title, all this information here. We don't have it implemented yet, but by the end of the week, you'll be able to filter on department course type term status and location. Uh, same thing with reserve items. We have a couple select fields for reserve items like processing status, copyright. All these will be searchable, filterable by the end of the weekish. And also you can search, you know, by title and things like that. Microcomputer. Brings you to the item, and then this will bring you to the reserve information. So this brings you to the reserve item information. If you want to go to the actual item, this will click you over, send you over into inventory. And if my computer wasn't so slow, you would see the inventory record there. But right now it's a little slow. Uh, the only other thing I just want to review real quickly, I think. Yes, is just the settings, so everybody sees that. So in settings, there's courses, and you have, these are the controlled sort of controlled vocabularies. And in the future, we're just, we have some more tweaking to do. Um, but basically, we will again retire after this is released um, and just maintain it until somebody else picks it up. We certainly, the SIG has identified some future uses or future use cases for additional development. But at this point, there's no um, plans to develop that. And I will also retire as PO. And it will be very sad not to work with everybody all the time because it's been fun. Any questions or did I miss anything? Anybody need to add anything? This looks amazing, Kelly. Thank you so much for sharing with us. It's Good job. Been Great course reserves team. All right, that was very cool. Okay, so next up is core functional. Um, Sergey is first, and then Michal, and then Bogdan. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yep. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> okay. 
There it is. You see it? Yeah. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. We do indeed. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to start with the user's application and introduce functionality that prevents the user from changing the due date on the item that is declared lost. I've already created the item with this status. Here it is. And as you can see, the change due date by button is disabled for this item and the change due date option is not shown here in the uh, action menu. Uh, if you select uh, another some, some items with uh, another status, for example, checked out, uh, the button change due date uh, becomes enabled and after clicking, we can see the mo uh, model uh, with status with uh, with message in uh, alert co detail column. Item is not declared lost for declare lost item. Uh, uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, fill the date and time for for this uh, module for example tomorrow date and 11 o'clock and if only the declare the item with declare lost status is uh, selected button still save and close but this button is disabled when we add another item with another status. The button becomes active. After clicking, we can, we can see the fail message for declare lost item. And as you can see, the current due date uh, didn't change for this item, but uh, for the item with checked out status, the current due date did change. Uh, the next functionality is about uh, renewal of the item with status declare lost for this for this item. When a user attempts to renew such an item, uh, this action is failed with a message "item not renewed, item is declared lost." Uh, but there is an ability to override that after cl clicking the override button. Uh, the model appears uh, with, a, with the message item not renewed, item is declared lost. Uh, and after filling the required field, uh, when we click the override button, uh, the, as we can see, the uh, item status for this button or for this item uh, changed to checked out. Uh, next functionality about creating the permission for users uh, to declare item lost. I've already create uh, this use, uh, user with permission uh, with permission that provides access to viewing loans uh, that user loans view and uh, already this user already has a loan uh, let's switch to this user and take a look uh, at, hi at his capabilities. For that, we logged out for admin, uh, login like a newly created user. Sorry. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. well, I don't know what happened. I think you can just use Aaron, Aaron as password. Yeah, yeah. All right. If you scroll down, is there any indicator like at the bottom of the page? Oh, for instance, it doesn't much. Uh, maybe somebody changed the password on your demo user. Maybe, maybe. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I, I have to skip this functionality and uh, move to another. Uh, we, the time is limited. And uh, I'm gonna, so. I'm gonna go to uh, request application. And in this uh, request application, the functionality of displaying all call number elements in the single string has been implemented. As you can see, uh, all the ele uh, element of call number uh, placed in appropriate order in the single string. Uh, the next functionality is placed in inventory application. Um, in, the, uh, in the inventory application, uh, we uh, we have uh, we have pain instance record and uh, the options like volume and year captions have been added to the item uh, detail list here. And uh, the last thing I would like to present is ability to filter instances by the nature of content. Now we in the inventory application in the instance segment and you can see the number content filter here. When we click on this title, a search box is displayed with a drop down menu uh, of value items. Search is performed by keyword. When we start entering some value, for example, this, uh, then in the result, uh, then you can see this uh, pattern is highlighted in the corresponding elements. And if we select, let's say, textbook item, uh, then in the result pane, pane uh, we will get the instances record, instance records in which the nature of content, nature of content is textbook. Whew. That's all from my side. Thank you for your, <laughs> for your Thank attention. Thank you, Sergei. Nice job. Um, nice use of the new um, highlight component too that Rasmus showed earlier. All right, cool. So Mikhail is up next. Um, hi everyone. Can you can you see my screen here? Yep. Okay. Let me just move some things around here. Uh, so I have a couple couple of simple stories here. It should be should be pretty fast. Um, the first one I would like to show you is something which uh, Svetlana was working on, and it's um, under inventory settings under modes of um, issuance. And what happened here is uh, the migration script has been created to rename some of the names and sources here, and also to make them all lowercase. So you can see that a um, couple of the names are different now. I think I have the view here with the existing values before and the renamed values and what we what we have there now. Uh, so this this is first change from Svetlana. Um, the next couple of uh, demos here will be all related to searching and, and filtering the inventory um, 
and inst instances. So the first first thing we we've added is under this holding segment, and it's uh, it's this ability to call to filter by call number um, in the I readable fashion. So I have um, I have the call number here already predefined, and if I hit search, you can see that I'm able to get some results. Um, we are also able to add an asterisk at the end. So just search by part of the call number and we should also be able to get some results. Um, that asterisk is, is um, considered a bug now, so we should be able to um, adjust this. So you, you won't need to put the asterisk at, at the end, um, pro probably in the next sprint. Um, a similar change here um, happened under item segments so you can also see the effective call number here and in a similar fashion you were able to just search and get some new, new results um, and then also under item we added this ability to uh, search by this new status called declare, declared lost and again if i choose um, choose that status i'm able to get um, get uh, um, instances with um, items which which have the status called uh, set as declare lost um, let's see and the next next uh, one is also in in the inventor is, is this it's it's this time it's under instances um, and we are now able to um, search by the um, suppress from discover set as no and this should get us um, this time some results so um, the work on this has been done also on the server to uh, uh, populate the, um, the boolean to no by by default. Um, I think before we this didn't work correctly, so this this should be this should be functioning correctly this time. Um, and the last thing here is um, something we it's a continuation of what Ser Sergey was showing us um, with the declare lost items when we try to. Check in, check in an, uh, an item which uh, has the status set to declared lost. We should be able to see a new uh, pop-up. Oh, that's that's actually not not the correct one. Um, perhaps that um, item changed its status. Uh, but let me maybe quickly find another one here. Uh, let's see, maybe this one. If I try to. Uh, checking in again you can see that um, this new pop-up shows up asking us if we want to continue with uh, checking in uh, an item with declared status um, de declared status like uh, set to declared lost um, and that's it from me please let me know if you have any questions thank you thanks Michal Bogdan you want to do your demo we'll probably skip the um, the save of check-ins but if you could do the claim return ones, I think that'd be great. Yeah, okay, so I will do just claim return demo. Let me share my screen. Um, are you able to see what I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna show actually um, ability to mark an item as claim returned. Uh, the claim return status in, is intended for for a case when a patron um, uh, thinks that a uh, patron thinks that uh, they has returned uh, the item, but uh, it still uh, shows as low need to him. Um, so for this, uh, we have to check out an item. Example for this guy. I have prepared an item. Check in. Um, Okay, now we have to go to the uh, loan details page. Uh, this which are also uh, available from the user's loan page. As you can see, we have the new claim return button. Uh, let's click on it. And we have to specify some reason. Claim returned for demo. Confirm. Okay, here it is. As you can see, a new action, a loan action uh, uh, history record has been created with items such as claim returned, action claims returned, 
And now let's check the item itself. It should have, uh, yeah, the claim return status. Yeah, here it is. Um, for 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 the for items with with such uh, with such status, we have um, pretty same uh, restriction as for declared loss. For example, we can't create um, a request for such items. We can't mark them as missing. Uh, we can uh, check out them one more time. Let's let's try. Yeah, uh, it says that we can't. Uh, check out it because it claim returned. That's it about the feature. Do you have any questions, guys? Nice, thank you, Bogdan. Great work. Well, we covered a ton of new development um, and we didn't leave a lot of time for QA updates. I'm sorry, Anton. Is there anything you want to say really quickly in the last few minutes? Well, the bug fest is coming. So in next in two weeks, we're going to start doing bug fest. Um, everything else, you could take a look at my slides. Um, coverage improved slightly, bug trend uh, not letting go. Uh, so we still have uh, somewhere between 600 and 700 bugs. Uh, so directive of dedicating 40% of time to bug fixing not helping. So we need to change how things are put together. Um, and that's pretty much it. So I don't want to stand in the way of your dinner. <laughs> All right, I appreciate that. Thank you, Anton. Any last thoughts from folks on the call? This was a great one to see. Lots and lots of functionality across the board. Thank you, everyone. It's exciting. And, and Anton, the numbers may not be getting better, but it, at least on the teams I've been involved with, I can say we worked on a ton of bugs, but the more people use it, the more things get reported, so. Uh, yeah. And the fact is that the more institutions will implement, the more bugs we'll have. So the point is that we need to have better, better uh, uh, press that produces our parts. If you have a crooked press, you will produce crooked parts all the time. And then you will have no time to build anything new because you'll be fixing bugs. So the point I'm trying to make is that we need to improve the process how our software is being built. Uh, and that's what those slides that I attached uh, are all about. And we will attempt in the Q2 to do extra steps um, to kind of start an effort in improving how things are being built. All right, well, that sounds exciting, Anton, and it seems like a great place to stop for today. Thank you everyone who demoed and participated. Uh, we'll um, share a link to the recording shortly. Have a good one.